As a producer, you're really a big project manager and you're constantly trying to figure out how to solve problems. Problems of resources, distribution, talent issues, uh, whatever it may be. And so I still use that analytical mindset. So yes, I went, got an electrical engineering degree and then along the way, ended up working in Hollywood. Welcome to Securing the Bag, The Roots exclusive series about work, entrepreneurship, and the secrets to success. Today we have with us producer extraordinaire Will Packer, who's responsible for amazing films like Girls Trip and Straight Outta Compton, and his latest project, the Peacock original film, Praise This. Welcome, Will. Thanks for having me. When I was doing my research on you, I found out that you have a degree in electrical engineering. Who would have thunk that? How the heck did you transition into the entertainment industry? That's a great question. I got the degree in engineering because when I was coming out of high school, I actually knew that I wanted to be an entrepreneur. So my plan was to go to business school, get my MBA. That's what I was told. That's how you, you know, become you know, learn the skills to become an entrepreneur and start your own business. And so that was my plan. But I was really uh, adept at math and science. And there was a big push to get more African Americans, specifically minorities in general, into the STEM program, science, technology, engineering, mathematics. So I got a scholarship to major in electrical engineering. It wasn't my passion. It wasn't really what I wanted to do. But I do have a head for it. I, I still have a very analytical mind and getting an engineering degree helped me hone those analytical skills. A lot of people will say, well, you just wasted your degree. You don't use that in Hollywood and the movie business. But I beg to differ because having that analytical mindset, I actually use that when I have to solve problems in Hollywood because as a producer, you're really a big project manager and you're constantly trying to figure out how to solve problems. Problems of resources, distribution, talent issues, whatever it may be. And so I still use that analytical mindset. So yes, I went, got an electrical engineering degree, and then along the way, ended up working in Hollywood with the creative folks that I deal with every day. So that means you're pretty smart, right? Yeah, you know. <laughs> So your alma mater, Florida A&M University, yes. they gave you a pretty big honor in 2021. They renamed the amphitheater after yes. you. I mean, yes. that's a big deal for somebody who's still alive. It's you. <laughs> <laughs> I am. Uh, hopefully, when this airs, I was still, <laughs> the way you said that, I got a little nervous. But you know, usually they wait until someone. Passes no, you're right. Away before they do it's funny like because that. at the um, at the ceremony where they named this amphitheater after me, I, I said, you know, cause I am a, a FAMU grad, proud. And I said, I'm, I don't know any of the other people that whose names are on the buildings around here. You know, I, they're not around anymore to your point. So it was such an honor for me to receive that while I'm still here um, and still relatively young. It really was an honor of a lifetime. You know, I just, I look at everything that I've done, but that stands out and is unique un, un unto itself. And I'm very, very blessed and fortunate. But it does speak to my belief in giving back to HBCUs and what they do for us as a culture, as a people, but also as a broader society. Now, I'd love for you to talk a little bit about how your experience at an HBCU kind of helped you navigate the industry that you're in now, which is largely white. Oh yeah, yeah, no, my experience was indispensable. I tell people all the time when they talk about HBCUs and they go, oh, it's too monolithic. Everybody, you know, just all black people, everybody looks the same. And I say, you know what, that is literally the most surface view that you could take is to say, well, everybody looks a certain way. But as you know, there is so much diversity within every community and the African American community is no exception. And so I met people from all over the world at FAMU and it was very competitive there because I came from St. Pete, Florida, very proud to have grown up there, great community, but not a lot of black folks. It was, you know, when I was growing up, a very small percentage of African-Americans there. I always stood out. I was always kind of the one or two black kids in my AP classes or in a particular program. And so I got a lot of attention and it was up to me what I did with that attention. Well, I went to FAMU and nobody was impressed because I was black <laughs> and what? So like, what are you gonna do? How are you gonna, you know, now excel within that environment? And it forced me to now use other skill sets and some of the most competitive environments I've been in. Hollywood has nothing like going on an HBCU campus and trying to compete with the frats, sororities, band, you know, the popular kids, everything there 
is a level playing field, but very competitive. I use those skills that I learned to navigate that world even now in Hollywood. So when I come in and I have to do a pitch uh, for one of my movies and I'm sitting there in a room full of execs around a table, I'm ready. Because I think this is nothing like when I had to go before the, the student senate at FAMU and try to raise money for my little small student film, which was called Chocolate City, and they didn't want to give it to me. And these are my peers going, I'm not impressed. Yeah, what, Packer? What are you going to do with it? You know? So I'm like, Hollywood's got nothing on, on my HBCU training. So I want to get into your career a little bit. You got into filmmaking in the 90s, and I may be a little biased because I'm of a certain age, but I feel like that was a pretty great time for black films. It was a time when no, films was. like Boys in the Hood yes. and Juice and things came out. But yep. what did you think the industry was missing, and why did you decide that you needed to add your voice? You know what? It was, it's interesting you bring up uh, the 90s as a little bit of a heyday uh, for black creators, black stories, black films and television, because you're right, you're definitely not wrong. I would say that we're also in, in uh, a renaissance moment right now because you have a lot of folks in front of the camera that um, you know, look like you and I. What I would say though is that you gotta remember Hollywood is way older than the 90s, right? And so there has been a dearth of imagery um, of appropriate, diverse, well-rounded imagery of minorities pick a disenfranchised community for so long, we got a lot of catching up to do. There are a lot of stories still yet to be told. And I don't care how many movies I make, I can't tell them all. So I need more Will Packers and more filmmakers that look like me that, are, that see the value on putting folks in front of and behind the camera that tell our stories in a way that feels organic and authentic to our audiences and not just our audiences, but to broad audiences. So I got in because I felt like there are more stories to be told and I could help to tell them. So collectively, your films have grossed nearly a billion dollars at the box crazy office. To even hear that. And you've had 10 films that have opened at number one. I mean, that's not something many producers can say, particularly producers of color. Yeah. Can you pinpoint the moment in your career where you feel like you secured the bag? It's interesting because you know, there is uh, the metaphorical bag of being in a position of power and respected by your peers and by people of power within the industry. I believe that that's a particular bag. And then there's the bag bag, right? There's the money. Right. When you actually, you know, have reached a certain level of, of, of economic empowerment. I think for me, it probably was the same. And it was a movie that I made that was called Stomp the Yard which is interesting because Stomp the Yard actually was an ode to my first film, which was called Chocolate City, which I shot as a student on the campus of Florida a University. And it was about black college life as we saw it through our eyes. And Stomp the Yard was a movie that also was set on a black college campus. Now the interesting thing is that I didn't get that movie greenlit or financed uh, by selling it as a movie about an HBCU. Nobody in Hollywood wanted to make that movie at that time, but they did see the value in dance movies. So what I did was I said, I got the perfect dance movie for you. And it's going to happen to take place on a college campus. And the dancers are gonna to happen to be in fraternities and sororities and do a completely new style of dance than you may be familiar with Hollywood, which of course was stepping. And so that's how I was able to get Stomp the Yard made. And it was very successful. It was a movie that I pitched all over Hollywood. Everybody told me no at least once, many people twice because I'm very uh, ambitious and persistent, so I would go back and change my pitch and adjust it, and I finally got uh, one studio to say yes. But you know, that's all you need is one. All you need is one yes. And I got that yes, and that movie opened number one at the box office, and so that's the one where I got the respect bag, and I also got a little bit of that financial bag, too. That's amazing. One of my all-time favorite You films. like Stomp the Yard? Yeah, it's a great, especially now, a, a, like a great rainy day film to watch. It is, <laughs> yeah, it is. so entertaining. Are you in a sorority by chance? I am. Okay, I'm not gonna guess, so don't make me do that. I was gonna ask you to guess. Well, do no. you know what fraternity, I'm in a fraternity. I know, because I did my research really? on you, so, so. See, that's not fair. So <laughs> I'm gonna just go, where did you pledge? Well, that's not gonna give you a hint. You don't know what's gonna give me a hint. Okay. Now you have to answer the question. <laughs> I, I went then, to the University of Illinois. Did you did you cross at the University of I Illinois? Did. So you cross undergrad mm -hmm. at University of Illinois Chicago. In Champaign, like In the Champaign. original <laughs> University of Illinois. Oh, yeah. okay. You meant that too. Yeah, the yeah, original yeah. University yeah, of Illinois. Don't get it twisted. You're you're my soror. You're an amazing <laughs> member of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated. <laughs> yes, I am. <laughs> this changes the game. Okay, back to you. <laughs> now we're not talking about me. So I have to ask, you produced the 
2022 Oscars, which is typically a show that black people aren't really that vested in, unless there's someone, one of us, that's up for an award or something so I've like heard. that. You know, I mean, we all remember the hashtag Oscar So White. Yes, so absolutely. I Started wanna, by the amazing April Rain. Shout absolutely, yep. yeah. So I want to ask you, how did you approach the show when you when you got the assignment? This is something that you're going to do. Yeah. Did you go into it thinking? I want to try to bring more black people into it, or did you just want to just produce a great show? I wanted to produce a great show. I wanted to produce a show that uh, was entertaining and that was popular and that would get audiences that uh, typically do not watch the Oscars would bring them to that show. And that show for me was a much more diverse show. Uh, for the very reasons that you said, there are a lot of audiences that just aren't interested in that because they don't see themselves, it doesn't feel interesting. And also just award show in general are tough right now because you have access to all the talent in a different way. Social media, I know what everybody's wearing and what they look like. It used to be you had to watch the Oscars to see your favorites in, you know, in their dresses and gowns and what they look like, who they're dating. Now we know all that stuff. So the award shows don't have that same immediacy and urgency. So I wanted to give it that. I wanted it to have, I, I wanted you to have a different reason to watch it. And so myself and my producing partner, we were very proud that we were the first all black producing team to take on the Oscars. And I'm still very, very proud of that show because we did have unprecedented levels of diversity. And certainly you had African-Americans in positions that are not typically there. We had HBCU students that actually brought out, they were the trophy presenters. We had an African-American conductor. We brought a DJ into the theater and but we had an amazing um, uh, Latino representation. We, we did a, uh, a version of We Don't Talk About Bruno and um, we had the first Afro-Colombian to ever perform on the Oscar stage. Of course, that night we had um, the first um, deaf Oscar winner, um, the first queer identifying Oscar uh, winner that night as well. So it was a night of first. It was it was really good. And that's all I remember about that night. What about you? <laughs> and it got great ratings and people for some reason are still talking about it. <laughs> you know, it's interesting though, in all seriousness, it was Shayla Cowan and I said, no matter what happens, we want to reverse the trend that had been happening every year of the ratings of the Oscars going down. We said, no matter what, we want our year for the ratings to go up for the first time in years. And we did that. That happened. Now, a lot of people think that something that happened later in the show had something to do with We're the ratings. We're not going to even talk about that. Here's the thing, though. It actually <laughs> yeah. did. You know, like people watch the show that really want to know kind of the mechanics of securing the bag. But well, the reality is that the uh, ratings are based on the first hour and a half to two hours of the show largely. And so something that happened that far, it was later in the show, did not help us with the ratings, right? Because if it did, I would have put the slap at the beginning. I'm just going <laughs> to tell you, I'm all about getting the ratings up. You do what you need to do. It happened too late in the show. And plus, we know, you know, viewer habits, when something like that happens, you don't go tune on the show to see what is already, you go online, you go, let me watch it, where is it? So social media exploded, of course. But, but that doesn't help. That didn't help the ratings. But we got, we did what we accomplished to do, what we set out to do, we accomplished it, which was to make the ratings go up for the first time in years. You've more than proven that you know how to make great movies and great television. So I'd love to know how you choose your projects these days. How do you know when you have a hit on your hand? Yeah, well, you know, I don't know that you know, know that you've got a hit, but I think you feel it sometimes. I've had some movies, um, Think Like a Man comes to mind, Girls Trip comes to mind, where I felt like, okay, if we market this right, people know about this, we get the right people to see it, this could really, really work. I've definitely felt like that. I always start thinking about the audience first. That is my philosophy. I'm trying to figure out what type of movie to produce. I'm thinking, what do audiences want to see? And who is that audience? I think very specifically, oftentimes I will make up a, a mythical person, right? And I will name that person. I talk about, you know, who he or she is and how many kids they got and where their job is. And I think about them and I say, okay, I'm making the movie for them because I know this is a movie that they're gonna really be into, they're gonna engage with. And then I try to broaden the audience out from there. And that's kind of my approach. And so actually with my latest film, Praise This, one of the things that I really wanted to do was make a movie that was faith-based for people that um, are looking for a faith-based type of film but not just a movie that felt like it was a church movie. There's nothing wrong with the church, but you know, the church is not the only way that you can access faith or spirituality. It's not about a person, a pastor. It's about you and your belief in a higher power. 
And so I wanted to make a movie that could appeal to people that had never been to church or hadn't been in a long time, couldn't name one Bible verse. And so we did that through the music in the film, which is amazing and mashes up gospel music with some of the biggest secular artists of the day, and humor, levity. You draw people in with that and then hopefully they stay and, and watch a story about the redemption of a young woman who is trying to find her voice and reconnect with her faith. I was saying when I watched the trailer, it kind of gave me like a gospel pitch perfect vibe almost. Was I'll take that. that. Okay. I'll take that. Yeah, I don't think that's far <laughs> off. Yeah. And it starts the amazing Chloe Bailey, who is just Chloe's awesome. so hot right now. She's super hot. She is, you know, Chloe is such a hard worker. That is what is going to sustain her. I work with, uh, very fortunate to work with a lot of amazingly talented people in Hollywood. Some of those people know that they're talented and rely on their talent. And nothing necessarily wrong with that, but they, the people that are the most successful in this industry aren't always the most, uh, the most talented. Mm -hmm. And they're not always the people who have the most access to resources, but they are the people who work the hardest. And so I have a tremendous amount of respect for those folks that I've worked with who have an incredible work ethic. Two people come to mind. Beyonce, you're not gonna outwork the Queen Bee, mm -hmm. and Chloe Bailey. Chloe Bailey is on the cusp of doing something that I think we haven't seen in a very long time, and it's because not only of her talent, but her work ethic. You have such an amazing career, and so people are probably just dying to get some words of wisdom from you. So, you know, right now in the entertainment industry, there's so much competition for eyeballs. I mean, you know, when I grew up, there were a few networks and PBS maybe, and then you could go to the movies on the weekend. But now with the streaming services, and, yes. you know, there's so many different ways to access content. Absolutely. How can you stand out? How can you, you know, make yourself known? Yeah. You know, for the aspiring filmmakers out there, I would say, first of all, realize that there's an oversaturation of content. Know the environment that you're coming into and adjust according to, accordingly. Know that audiences have got, you can watch whatever you're into, whatever type of you know, movie, TV, film, documentary, whatever you want, somebody's made it, it's out there, there's a version of it, right? However, as a filmmaker, it doesn't mean that you can't stand out, it means that you must work harder to do so. You've gotta have something that feels different and unique. Oftentimes, authenticity is a way in. I always say to people, what's your story that you know that you can tell better than anybody else on the planet? What is that? Look at that and try to lean into that. That's your superpower, your thing, right? What you do well and what you know and what you've experienced, that is unique to you. I tell people all the time, make sure that you can do something that connects with an audience. Don't worry about Hollywood. People oftentimes think, how can I get to you know, a Will Packer or how can I get to Disney or Sony or, or Universal? And I say, get to the people, get to the audience. You get to them and you're able to show that you have something that audiences, especially if you can get numbers of audiences to engage, the rest of the folks will call. Will Packer will call you <laughs> if you got something great that's out there doing numbers. That's great advice. Yeah. Thank you so much, Will Packer, of for course. sharing your words of wisdom with us. Absolutely. Everybody, make sure you check out Is This on Peacock. On Peacock, yes, absolutely. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks so much.